worship as we celebrate the Lord's Supper and sing God's praises, and he is the one that's worthy uh, of that. Uh, One of the things that Jesus did on the cross among many for us is to destroy the works of the devil. In 1 John chapter 3, uh, that is a specific thing that he did uh, on the cross. Uh, In the meantime, in the world in which we live, the scripture describes that the God of this world, a little G God, uh, is Satan himself, and he has an organized force of demons uh, that he is unleashing uh, on uh, our world. There will be a day when they're finally uh, defeated. They're defeated. There will be a day when it's finally over with in the new heavens uh, and the new earth. Uh, Prior to that, Uh, There is this spiritual battle, this war that's going on with dark forces, demonic forces in our world. So I'd ask you a question this morning. If I asked you personally, like I did three other people earlier today, uh, before I arrived here, uh, if I told you I was preaching about demons today, what comes to your mind? What could be the one girl who looked at me with a blank face? And I said, nothing comes to your mind, does it? Like it's never a thought that you think about demons in this world. She said, no. Or it could be the older gentleman that I was speaking to and I asked him the very same question. He immediately named off a presidential candidate. (laughs) Or it could be the other lady that I talked to who said, you know what? I've been thinking about this actually and there are some generational curses in our family, and I just believe that demons have gotten in there and continue to pass those down through our family, and I'm asking God to break those uh, that are in our family. Well, if you're turning your Bibles to Mark chapter five, regardless of what your thinking is today, uh, I'd like to just anchor ourselves to what Jesus' thinking is and what the scripture tells us about uh, this demonic and dark world Uh, that we find ourselves uh, in the midst of and how we can actually have power uh, over demonic forces. Uh, In Mark chapter five, we'll see that unfold. There's a number of instances in uh, the gospel where uh, Jesus is encountering the demonic uh, and this is the story where we'll anchor in uh, and look for the power that we too can have today uh, over those demonic forces. Before we unpack this, this will say a couple things about our serve week that's coming. Uh, If you've signed up and not received your assignment on your way out, you can go to the kiosk in the hallway and they can let you know where you'll be. It's also the place where you can sign up if you haven't signed up already to be a part. Uh, And then I wanna invite you to a week from Monday. We'll not gather in here for our worship. Next Sunday, we'll gather in the community uh, as we serve the community in Jesus' name. Uh, And then on Monday night, September 16th, that is our exact 25th year anniversary of the first worship service uh, that we had uh, for 121. Uh, Jeff and Jordan Johnson, who lead at Passion City uh, in Atlanta, lead worship there. They were a part of the early years of 121. They'll be leading our worship that night, and uh, it'll just be a time to celebrate what God's done uh, over these last 25 years. I hope you can arrange your schedules to be a part Monday night, 7 o'clock, September 16th. But I want us to think specifically this morning about the power that we can have over the demonic forces. And the first thing that I would say about this from this particular story uh, is in the first five verses, and that's to recognize the reality of demonic forces. Uh, And there's this whole range of the way people think. It could be like that young lady, it never crosses your mind. It might be that uh, you're all over it and you're in the spiritual fight and you get what's going on in the invisible realm today. Or it might be somewhere in between. Or it might be you're curious, you don't understand, and please help me. I wanna get in on uh, the way Jesus uh, went at this with the demonic forces. Uh, But the first thing is to recognize the reality of demonic forces, that they are real. Uh, In chapter five, verse one, they came to the other side uh, of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. Uh, They had just come off the storm that Jesus calmed uh, for them. Jermaine did a phenomenal job last week preaching on Mark 4, 35 to 41. They're emerging out of that, and now they come to the other side into a Gentile region. Now, I don't know about you, but I went years as a Christian reading the Bible, and I could never figure out what is a Gentile. Uh, It's not in the common language. I don't remember talking about it in high school or college or anywhere else. It's just, what is this word? Uh, And a Gentile is just a non-Jew. 
Uh, so when we read the scriptures, we're talking about those who are Jews and those who are non-Jews. Jesus has come into this region that is a non-Jewish uh, region. And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Uh, this is uh, his, uh, they get to the other side, he gets out of the boat, immediately, that's a, uh, a marker throughout Mark, 41 times, he'll use this word immediately, there's an urgency in most of what he writes, uh, and he's this man from the tombs has an e- unclean spirit. Uh, that unclean spirit is a demonic spirit, it, it's a demon, uh, and he had his dwelling among the tombs in verse three, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. So this is a man now that is uh, gripped by demonic forces. He is living in the tombs. That would have been caves. Uh, So just imagine an area of caves, uh, and that's where he's living. And in verse four, uh, he had been often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day in verse five, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. We've called this series The Real Jesus, and Jesus is encountering real demonic forces in the lives of people. And we see the reality of the effects of the demons on this particular man. There's no doubt that growing up or at whatever point he became uh, overwhelmed by these demons that everybody in their small community would have been doing whatever they could to be a help to him. But it was clear that he had a strength beyond what they could handle. He had a superhuman kind of strength. So we see that from the demonic. Uh, They couldn't even with chains, they couldn't uh, keep him uh, under wraps that way. They weren't strong enough to subdue him that way. I'm reminded of the Lord of the Rings and Gollum uh, in the mountains in the caves, uh, just screaming and shrieking and tormented. And I think that's a decent idea of what was happening here uh, with this man. He was cutting himself as well, night and day. Body would have been scarred all over from the, the cuts of what he had done. So these demonic forces uh, had hold of this man. He was at a point now where he was isolated from the community. I've been reading a book by Chuck Swindoll uh, on the life of Paul. uh, And there's a quote I was reading this week from a Stanford University psychologist. He said, I know of no more potent killer than isolationism. There's no more destructive influence on physical and mental health. The effects on this man, this uh, demon-gripped man, uh, were ones of isolation, of torture from the inside out. And all that was being expressed in outward ways. I don't know what you think about the demonic, but it is real. And there are dark forces that are at work in this world today, as much as they were at work in the world then. Martin, uh, Mark Bubeck wrote a book uh, called The Adversary that someone recommended to me uh, uh, probably two or three years ago now. And uh, I found it to be an incredibly uh, helpful book uh, about demons, about warfare. Uh, so if this would be something you'd be interested in spend a little more time on. I think he's very helpful. He gives practical ways to pray. Uh, He organizes the scripture in a way to understand Satan is our adversary. Uh, Satan has uh, an organized uh, group of demons. Uh, Demons, by definition, would be fallen angels in rebellion against God. Uh, And Satan has this force uh, that he's organized and unleashes uh, on all of the world. Uh, And he unleashes that force in varying degrees for a variety of reasons uh, in what he's trying to do. And what will always characterize, what will always characterize what Satan is doing and his demons are doing will be destruction. He will be characterized where there's destruction, you can be sure uh, that Satan is somewhere uh, in the mix uh, of what's happening uh, with it. That is his primary goal. One of the things I appreciate about Bubeck in his book is the way he ties together, talking about the flesh, our sinful human flesh, 
the world, which is in opposition to the things of God, and then Satan himself. Uh, and this is what he says uh, about the flesh uh, on page 36. And now we have the quote on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> he said, this warning indicates that when a believer, <clears throat> excuse me, exercises his or her will to commit these fleshly sins, they give place, literally claim practical ground to Satan's activity in his life. He goes on to say that it's a believer's willful indulgence in fleshly sins. It gives the enemy a place or a claim against us, which he will be quick to exploit. In Galatians 5, there's this ugly list of sin uh, that uh, characterizes our flesh, our human sinful flesh. Uh, and if we continue in those particular sins, over time, what he tells us is that Satan will begin to co-opt that and he'll lay claim on it in a way uh, that it's all the more destructive on the person. And then he goes on to talk about the world and in a quote on page 54, he says, the world system intensifies our fleshliness by offering a climate and a system that promotes these fleshly sins. The world system begins to surround man with that which intensifies the inner problem he already has as a fallen creature. I think it's a good descriptor of what happens. We have this human tendency to sin. We're prone to it. The scripture says there's no one good, not even one. As much as we wanna make ourselves out to be good, the scripture says clearly we are not. Uh, we are sinful, our hearts are deceptive, uh, and when we continue in sin, then that gives Satan a claim in that, a foothold, a stronghold, and once he gets in there, it makes it more difficult to break free. Now, the way we fight sin on a daily basis is to die to it. We're asking God, I'm asking God every day to kill today the pride, the selfishness, the lust, the anxiety, the jealousy, the envy, the bitterness, angerness. I ask him to kill that so it won't kill me, as the Puritan writer John Owen described it. But if we allow it to continue to get a hold, Satan co-ops it. And he works with the world, which creates an environment that makes it much easier for the flesh to sin against God and Satan to co-opt it. So he's working together with those two uh, avenues. I'll give you an example, Ephesians chapter four, uh, verses 26 and 27. And it says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down, down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. We live in an angry culture. We have homes that are loaded with anger right now. And when we continue in that anger, it gives the devil an opportunity to get a foothold in that home or in that nation. And as we continue to walk in darkness, Satan co-ops and gives more opportunity through the world and through the flesh, that anger. We have a solution for it in Ephesians 4. Be angry and yet do not sin. There is a righteous anger. I would submit a good portion of the time that's not what our anger is. Confession and repentance would be the way to work with that day in and day out. And we're asking God to change it so there cannot be a grip of those demonic forces along with it. A, a way to maybe picture this, you ever on a trip, you drive by a hotel or a motel, and it says vacancy, something like that. Whenever we continue in besetting sins, what we're saying to Satan and the demonic forces, there's a vacancy here. Come on in and occupy that room. And he can occupy one room in that motel and it's gonna make that whole place rough. Think about our home, ourselves, if we just thought about our, our bodies as a motel. And we just open up one room and say, here's a vacancy here for you. Come on in. He gets a foothold, and the scripture says that, that foothold, it's like a stronghold. It gets stronger and stronger the more we feed it. 
That would be an example. So we recognize the reality of demonic forces. They're at work. But what do we do with those? How do we, how do we have uh, the power to overcome them? Because in Jesus, we have the power uh, to overcome the demonic forces. So the second thing in this story as it unfolds is to look to Jesus to expel the demons. Uh, we're not going to be able to do this on our own. Uh, it's Jesus that can expel them. Verse six, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. Now this is interesting about demons. The demons have taken over this man uh, and then they're running to Jesus uh, and bowing before him. The demons are coming and they are worshiping before Jesus. In, in James chapter two, verse 19, it says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. The demons believe God. They believe in God. And, and I, I just want you to hear this, that, that if you, well, I want you to hear a lot of things today. <laughs> but when people say they believe in God, so do the demons. That does not believe, that does not mean they're a follower of Jesus. The demons believe. And they believe so much, they know who he is, they know he has power, and they bow before him. And yet, we have a nation full of people they say they believe in God, they give him a quick head nod if they even do that. So the demons believe. In verse seven, they're shouting with a loud voice. They've overcome his voice, the man's voice. What business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? They know who he is. He's the son of the most high God. And I implore you, I beg you by God, do not torment me. They know that their destiny is torment in the abyss and an eternal hell forever. They know that. And part of what they're wondering if Jesus casts them out, is this the time? Well, they'll be cast into that eternal destiny uh, into hell. And they don't, they don't want that to happen. For he'd been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what's your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. The word Legion would be, uh, uh, there'd be 6,000 Roman soldiers in a legion. So whether this was 6,000 demons that had a grip on this man or whether it was uh, thousands, the point is this man was overcome by a whole army uh, of demons. Uh, and then in verse 10, he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Uh, so apparently we find in this story that demons don't wanna just be wandering around. They wanna occupy something that they can destroy. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission, and he coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and what the demons didn't know is that the herd would then rush down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Jesus has the power and the authority to expel the demons. They are real. They are real Biblical days, they're real today. They're not just real overseas, they're real in the US. They're real in our community right now. And Jesus has the power to expel them. In Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, we recognize where our real battle lies. It's not against people, it's not against flesh and blood. Verse 12, Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this, this story helps us see where the real battle is, where the real war is. And our battle's not against people. Our battle is in the invisible places against Satan and his organized forces of darkness that he unleashes in varying degrees. In the scripture, we'll see sometimes somebody has one demon, somebody might have seven demons, there might be a whole army of demons, there are different ways he'll oppress, there's different ways that he'll attack. We also learn in Ephesians that his attacks are like fiery darts uh, coming at us. So there's an onslaught of evil that is coming against us. Sometimes we've been told uh, to be careful uh, that 
we don't get too consumed with the demonic and with Satan. I don't think that's our danger today. We could, but I don't think that's the challenge. I think our challenge is to recognize that's where the real fight and the real battle is, and how do we actually engage and get in the fight so that there can be freedom uh, for people who are being oppressed and gripped by the demonic. And that battle happens in the invisible realm. In Mark chapter three, verse 27, Jesus says that no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. He's talking about Satan. He said, unless Satan is first bound and then removed, and you can't plunder the house, you can't take it over. I thought about it this way as one way to maybe give a picture of that. When I have to cut branches down out of a tree or, or we have to have them like four feet by four feet or something and wrapped up for them to be taken. And so I'll, I'll take them, I'll bind them up and then I'll put them out by the curb and then in the beauty of the way our cities are set up, the next morning they're gone. It's the same. Satan and the demonic, they have to be bound up and put away. We've created vacancies. We need to get them out. But Jesus also says it's important that the room gets filled up with something else or they're gonna come back with more of a vengeance. So in Jesus' name, in his authority, and his power, demons can be removed but if it's not replaced, they're coming back in full force to occupy that room and to begin tearing the house down again. I think we all know that when there's something amiss in a room in our house, the rest of the house feels the effect of it. It's not just that one room. How do we do this? Here's a scripture that you could pray routinely to get in this fight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, <clears throat> verse three through five. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So we, we walk in the flesh, we see each other, this is how we walk, this isn't where the war is. The war is not in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, <clears throat> but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So we have this uh, spiritual, <clears throat> divinely powerful uh, kind of war that we're in. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I could lock in every day and get in on the spiritual battle and pray 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through five, because what Satan does is he builds up these fortresses in people's lives. They're built on lies and on deception. And the more those lies are fed and the more that that deception occurs, the stronger that fortress gets. And we can bring truth against it. It might take some time, but we keep bringing truth against it again and again and again. And we get in the fight in prayer and we're praying that God will tear down those lies, that knowledge of arrogance, the things that puff up, the deceptions, the lies. God will tear those down and instead replace those with truth that their heart and mind will be taken captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm praying that people will be taken captive to the obedience of Jesus. In Jesus, we have power over the demonic. Our primary weapon is in prayer, and that's where we can win with Jesus. The demonic is real. Jesus can expel it. We can be a part of that. prayer and leaning on Jesus to do it. The third thing we see in this story is to celebrate the calm that Jesus brings. 
Well, he is the one that expels the demons. In verse 14, their herdsmen ran away and reported in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And, and everybody was curious, right? I mean, their, their, their economic revenue was taken from them when those 2,000 pigs uh, went over the cliff. So the herdsmen were talking about that as well as what happened to this man. So everybody's curious. They want to know what happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they became frightened. So they come out here. It's remarkable the parallels in this and what we talked about a week ago with Jesus calming the storm. In that storm, Jesus comes and he brings a perfect calm to it. There's a storm in this man's life and Jesus comes and he brings a perfect calm. That's what Jesus does. He brings a calm. He brings a peace. Satan's the destroyer. It's destructive. There's upheaval. With Jesus, calm, peace, joy, there's life. Can you imagine? The whole community had watched this guy. They couldn't figure out how to subdue him, so they finally just put him out of town and isolate him. Now he's clothed and in his right mind. Those who had seen it described to them how it happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine, so they described everything about the man and the pigs, and they began to implore him to leave their region. Now, the way I frame this third point is to celebrate the calm that Jesus brings. But that's not what happened here. They didn't celebrate it. They wanted Jesus gone. People have wondered why pigs, why did he cast out demons and let them go to the pigs? There's a couple of thoughts that some have offered. One, it gave a real visible demonstration of the demonic power that had gripped that man. And you could just see it visibly as the pigs went off the cliff. Or someone else said, it might be that Jesus did it to give the people a choice in that community. Are you gonna love your pigs? Are you gonna love Jesus? And they were more concerned that if Jesus stuck around, there might be more hurt to the economy. It looks like they chose the pigs. They wanted him to leave. And as someone noted, there are some times when requests are made to Jesus that it's sad that he answers them because he left. But we wanna celebrate the calm that Jesus brings. And we, we live in a, a culture today, uh, in a nation that I believe has been blinded by the enemy. We may not see this exact kind of scenario, but Satan works with his demons in a variety of ways. And I, I, I believe our nation has been blinded. We're becoming increasingly darkened in our understanding of things. We have leaders actively advocating for the death of babies in the womb. We have a sexual ethic that has been completely turned away from what God's ethic is. We have gender confusion because we've run from what God says is male, female. We have addictions to drugs, alcohol, pornography, just keep going down the list. We have isolation Anxiety and depression, it's off the charts. We have, as was recently reported in a survey, a number of places popping up in former church buildings that no longer wanna proclaim Christ, but they wanna gather, they wanna, they want like everything the church has except for Jesus. 
And they're, they're literally gathering around uncertainty. Gathering up just like we are today around the idea that everything's uncertain. Now, every one of those things I just described gives an opportunity and a foothold for Satan to be able to get in, co-opt, and take over. I wanna be really careful here. Sometimes we just need to die to a sin. Sometimes we need just to escape something in the world. Sometimes there really are physical things that are wrong and need to be taken care of uh, in a physical way. Sometimes a counselor is helpful. But do we leave out the possibility that there is dark demonic forces that have gotten hold and maybe that's the problem? And we wanna fight each enemy in the appropriate way. And so we wanna ask God for discernment to know when it's the the demonic forces that we need to claim in the name of Jesus that they don't get to be here. And then celebrate the calm that Jesus brings. It might be easy to look at this and say that I really can't identify with this story and this guy, but I would say today that all of us are this man. Prior to knowing Christ, we are all tormented and blinded by Satan. Sin occupies and darkens our hearts, but the good news is that Jesus came to rescue us from the domain of darkness and to transfer us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There is a freedom that comes in Jesus Christ and Christ Christ. It's why we take the Lord's Supper, to remember. And that's where the victory comes, is through Christ and what he did uh, on the cross on our behalf. In Colossians chapter two, we see the victory that we have and that we can walk in. <clears throat> Verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. They thought they had him on the cross, that they had humiliated and shamed him. But on that cross, Jesus was making a public display of his enemies and the demonic and dark forces. And then he would go to a tomb. He would know what it would be like to be this man that lived in the tombs. He would go into that tomb, but that tomb wouldn't hold him. God would raise him up out of that tomb, out of the dead. And he overcame death, overcame sin, and overcame all the demonic forces. We can walk in power, we can walk in victory, and we can walk in the authority of Jesus Christ. The whole gospel of Mark is about Jesus Christ who is the king, who's the divine God, who has power and authority. He has power and authority over sin. He has power and authority over nature. He has power and authority over the Sabbath. He has power and authority over the demonic. That's just the first five chapters, and there's more to come. But he is the one who has the power. And he's given us with the armor of God, uh, the, the ability to fight ongoing against the flaming darts of the enemy. And we do that with the word of God. The way Jesus fought Satan was with God's word. So we immerse ourselves. How do we do this? When we receive Jesus Christ, what we're saying is no vacancy. There is no room for Satan anymore. There's no room for the darkness anymore. Light is what fills our hearts. And we keep the house lit by remaining in God's word, by hanging out with Jesus, by singing praises so that he's not welcome here, by praying and fighting on our knees. We can sing the song, The Battle Belongs to You, and then we wanna get on our knees in the quiet place and get in on that fight because it's his battle and that's where we win it, is on our knees with him. And we keep the no vacancy sign up for Satan because we're filled up with Jesus Christ. 
And when somebody knows Jesus, yeah, go ahead. And we're filled up with Jesus, then we do the last thing that he says in this story, and we report the great things that Jesus has done. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. I don't blame him. I don't want to go with him too, wouldn't you? You just rescued me from the darkest possible thing I could be in. Now I have a right mind. I'm gonna follow you. And he didn't let him know. But he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. I want you to be the one person to go back into the Decapolis in verse 20 and you start telling what great things Jesus has done and then everyone will be amazed. You're the one person that knows Jesus and I want you to go into these 10 cities and you start telling about what's happened. He didn't have a discipleship course. He didn't have a Bible study teacher. He didn't have an evangelism training video. He just knew Jesus had met him and cleared him out and he was filled with life and he started telling people about it. Amen. Now, wouldn't we wanna do the same? Because this is the hope for your family. This is the hope for our nation. This is the hope for our world. It's Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ the victor, Christ the triumphant one. Father, thank you for our, our time in your word. And guys, it's been a beautiful morning of, of praise to you, of remembering uh, with the elements, the victory at the cross. Father, help us be alert to the schemes of the enemy and the demonic forces. Teach us how to fight in the spiritual realms so that we can walk in ongoing victory and be a part in Jesus' name of people being freed and released, forgiven, calm, and in their right mind, God. You do that one by one in our nation and in the world of which you're the only hope that we have today and what a hope it is. I pray in Jesus' name. Let's just be quiet for a moment and begin contemplating what God is specifically saying to you and the ways you would walk in obedience to what God might be saying.